everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, wherever you might be dialing in from around the world. Thank you all for joining us for today's webinar, a new biometric that fraudsters hate and users love, presented by IT Novarik Group and Incognia. I'm Caitlin Labby, and I'll be your host for today's webinar. We'll be starting the webinar shortly, but first, let me just cover a few quick housekeeping items. Today's webinar will be recorded and a link to view the recording on demand will be available after the session. We will be taking questions at the end of the webinar, so please feel free to submit your questions using the questions feature located in the GoToWebinar toolbar to the right of your screen. It is now my pleasure to introduce today's speakers. David Matei is a strategic advisor in IT Novarica Group's fraud and AML practice. He has over 15 years of experience in the payments industry designing, building, and launching fraud and dispute systems. Fraud constantly poses financial and reputational risks to parties on both sides of a transaction, and David's customers have included merchants and financial institutions, giving him a unique and comprehensive perspective on these issues. David is joined today by Andre Faraz. Andre is the CEO and co-founder of Incognia, a location identity company based in Palo Alto, California, that provides mobile authentication to banks, fintech, and mobile commerce. Andre is an expert on location technology and a strong advocate for user privacy. To this date, the location technology developed by Andre and his co-founders have been deployed on more than 200 million smartphones. So without further ado, I'll turn the mic over now to David for further introductions and to dive into today's content. Thank you again for joining us and we hope you enjoy today's webinar. Take it away, David. Thank you much, Caitlin, appreciate it. Hey, Andre, thank you for joining me today. I appreciate you actually joining me and uh, looking forward to our conversation today. Likewise, it's a pleasure to be here. Absolutely. Yeah, for those who may not know about IT Novarker Group, we are an advisory firm focusing in the financial services industry. Uh, I am within the fraud and AML practice uh, out of the money practices that we do have. So I focus specifically on the fraud world and uh, we do both advisory services and uh, consulting services for our clients. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about location services. And the reason why is because there is certainly a problem that we have out there in the area of account takeover uh, and a lot of the fraud losses associated with this. In the first quarter of this year, we did a study of over 8,500 U.S. consumers and 16% of them said that they had been in a victim of account takeover fraud uh, sometime over the past year. And this is down just a little bit from 2020, and that's mainly just because of all the stimulus funds that were flowing into the economy and during the pandemic, fraudsters were doing more rampant actually in their account takeover fraud that they were doing. And so therefore, uh, 20 was, 2020 was rather a busy year for account takeover. Uh, it was good to see that it decreased a little bit in 2021, down to only 16% as opposed to almost 40% actually. Uh, but still, it's a problem. And the fact is, is that uh, these losses associated with account takeover fraud are in billions. Uh, upwards of like eight to $10 billion a year being lost uh, on the basis of ATL fraud. There's another issue that we're actually having with account takeover fraud, and that has to do with the impact that it has in terms of consumers and their confidence they have within their financial institution. In the same survey of first quarter of this year of 8,500 U.S. consumers, uh, we found that almost 40%, uh, 36 to be exact, uh, but uh, almost uh, those 30% of the U.S. consumers indicated that they either moved all of their accounts away from their FI or some of their accounts from the FI to another institution because the fact that their confidence was shaken uh, when it came to the account takeover fraud that they had experienced. So that kind of brings us to where we are today in terms of this particular discussion, in terms of what could be done from an authentication standpoint uh, to, in order to verify who the real identity is of the person on the other end of a digital interaction. And that could be through online banking, through a laptop desktop device. It could be through mobile uh, banking applications. And uh, even if we have a few clients, I mean, customers on the line who are from the e-commerce world, I mean, merchants are actually dealing with this particular issue as well. 
So what I'd like to do is just kind of jump into our first question that we have here today. And that is going back to uh, you, uh, Andre. So biometrics have been around for a long time. You know, there are physical biometrics. You know, we use face ID and fingerprints. Uh, we also use uh, behavioral biometrics. And behavioral biometrics is certainly a situation there where uh, you are able to look at a variety of different activities or patterns associated with the user. For example, there is uh, things such as typing speed, uh, data familiarity, uh, mouse movements, things along those lines. Uh, and so again, device uh, fingerprinting, we got behavioral biometrics, but now we got this new thing. Uh, we got this new thing called location behavior. So what is location behavior and what does it do? Excellent, thanks David. So, so yeah, basically location behavior goes a little bit beyond just analyzing, for example, the IP address of a user and understanding in which city they are located, right? Location behavior goes a lot deeper than that. We're talking about really understanding the user's trusted locations, meaning the places that they go most, most frequently, like for example, their office, their home address, um, and, and basically where they spend most of their time. And, and the reason why this is important and, and if we think about it intuitively, uh, most of the high-risk transactions when it comes to financial services are associated to uh, users being in safe environments, right? So for example, when I'm moving money, I'm usually doing that from my home or from my office, right? And one of the things we see is that about 95% of the high-risk transactions, legitimate uh, financial transactions occur uh, from trusted locations, right? Um, same applies to other uh, high-risk situations, like when the user is, for example, authorizing a new device. Let's say that you just bought a new iPhone and you want to set up your account on this new new phone. 89% um, of the time, that would happen from a trusted location. Same applies to account opening. 85% of new accounts are opened actually when the user is at home. So when it comes to mobile, banking specifically. So uh, there is a very strong correlation between um, the presence at trusted locations and good transactions. So that's why we're leveraging it. Uh, but it, as I've mentioned, it, it goes a lot beyond uh, just analyzing which city the user is based on IP data. Yeah, it's interesting to see these percentages that you have on the screen right now in terms of, especially from a new account opening standpoint, uh, the fact that um, so much of that is actually done from a familiar, usually a home location like that. Uh, so I, I, yeah. I'd be interested in knowing about physical biometrics because they're pretty specific to an individual. You know, we all have unique fingerprints and faces. Mm -hmm. Likewise, in the behavioral biometrics world, you know, nobody knows my social security number as well as I do or can type my last name as fast as I can type it. So mm -hmm. why aren't those kind of solutions good enough to uniquely authenticate a user? And why do we need location in order to be able to uh, to address this? Yeah, that's a good point. So um, as we all know, like there is no silver bullet when it comes to, to online authentication. And there's always a vulnerability here and there um, in, in each of these factors, right? So. The ideal scenario here is that you really have as many layers as possible to make sure that that person is really who they say they are. Um, and in, in when it comes to, for example, count takeovers more specifically, the challenge here is that there's like, when there is an account takeover going on, that's usually a new device that's trying to access an existing account, right? And the issue then is, Given it's a new device, this new device, for example, might not be yet on, like, as part of the network of uh, uh, the, the device fingerprinting vendors, right? So you still can't tell if that's a trusted device or not. It's just an unknown device. So what usually happens then is, okay, for this new device, I have to uh, step up authentication and I have to introduce new factors. So let's say SMS-based OTPs or biometrics or et cetera. But then there are some other challenges on top of that, which is for each of these new factors, 
um, there's added complexity for the user in terms of friction and added vulnerabilities, right? So uh, for everything that is based on credentials, for example, like OTPs, um, that could be social engineered. Um, when it comes to biometrics, you have two types, right? You have on-device biometrics, which in this case, it's not really useful because it's a new device. So uh, you're just verifying if the person that's using that device is the owner of that device, but you don't know yet if the owner if is associated with, with that identity. And then you have cloud biometrics, uh, which can be spoofed with injection and presentation attacks, right? And finally, when it comes to behavioral biometrics, um, it usually takes some time to learn the user's pattern. Um, and there are like very high false positive rates, especially in situations that are new, right? When the user changes a device. So this is basically one of the key gaps in which location can help because as we see here, 89% of legitimate device changes occur from trusted locations, right? So if you don't know yet if that device is trustworthy or not, um, and you can't use on-device biometrics because of that, and behavioral biometrics might uh, not be very useful at that moment because that's still an unknown device and, and the user is, um, given it's a new device, the user might use it a little bit differently. So it might lead to false positive rates. Another signal that you can add there is location, right? If you recognize, okay, even though this is a new device, but this user is at home, for example, I can trust it more easily. Hmm, interesting. Um, so it, it, device fingerprinting, those solutions collect IP addresses. Mm -hmm. And there have been reports of actually fraudsters being able to fake the IP address to make it look that they are close to where a user actually lives. Uh, and again, trying to spoof the location yeah. there. Uh, but there are ways that, other ways as well, that a fraudster can spoof a user. So what are some of those spoofing methods that the fraudster use? And you know, if we're talking about location, couldn't a fraudster use those same technologies to fake the location and personally a good user? Perfect, yeah. So before talking about spoofing, um, I'm actually going to, to talk a little bit about what comes before that, right? So um, as we know, there were like a number of, of data breaches recently. So there is a lot of PII data out there and that PII data includes physical address information, right? So you can buy someone else's profile on the deep web or not even need to go to the deep web on like Telegram forums, for example, you can buy a lot of this information so you're going to have there like a name, a phone number, an email address, a physical address. So once you know the user's physical address, um, you already have a target for uh, the, the location in which you should emulate um, to show that you are, uh, to, so, so you can impersonate that, that identity, right? Um, so once you have that, you can do, uh, you, you can spoof location data in two ways. If the application is relying only on IP address geolocation, um, it's really, really easy to spoof because the user can use a number of tools, right? So they can use a VPN, they can use a proxy, they can use a static IP, um, they can use like uh, uh, IP tunneling. So there are a number of tools that the fraudster can use to, to say that they're in, at a certain location. And in this case, once they have visibility about your physical address, they're going to show up as if they were in your city, right? So uh, the, the solutions won't be able to, to, to differentiate that and will probably think that that person is you. So that's IP. The other part is GPS, right? Um, so some applications, especially mobile applications, have access to more granular location information. And in this case, it would be the GPS data that is provided by the operating system. So in theory, that would work pretty well, right? The operating system is, is letting you access precise location information. But the problem though, is that there is a, a, a feature that was built by the operating systems it actually became a security vulnerability. 
And that feature was built to enable software developers, application developers, to simulate that they're in a certain location so that they can test an application. So let's say I'm, I'm a mobile developer at a large uh, tech company. Let's say I'm, I'm a mobile developer at Facebook, right? Which is a global company. But I'm sitting here at the office in Menlo Park, California, developing a feature for the Facebook in Mexico, right? So how would I test that feature if I'm not in Mexico, right? So the operating system gives me the power as a developer to change this, the result of the OS level geolocation to say that I'm in Mexico so I can test that feature. So it was a feature, it's a good feature, but unfortunately that's being exploited by fraudsters. So for a fraudster to spoof GPS information, they can simply go to the, the app store and search for fake GPS. If you test it right now, you're gonna find a bunch of apps. Um, and if you download one of these apps, the only thing you need to do on your phone is to activate developer mode, right? So if you activate developer mode, these apps are going to give you the ability to spoof location information. So in the end of the day, if you are relying on either IP-based geolocation or OS-based GPS data, that's, that's not useful, right? Um, so what you really need to do is to build uh, capabilities to identify location spoofing so that you can actually use location as an authentication factor. So the fraudsters are using a tool for mobile app developers for doing testing and they're actually to actually hide their actual GPS. Exactly. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, that's pretty bad. <laughs> oh my gosh. So it does yeah. become a problem out there, no doubt about that. So one of the other things that we hear about oh. from finance institutions, they have multiple tools in terms of how they go off and authenticate a user. Uh, but there are times when these tools don't always give a kind of a black or white answer in terms of, yes, it is a good customer or it's a fraudster. You know, we always kind of want that very binary black and white, yes, no. Uh, but a lot of these tools will come back with what we call the gray areas. You're, you're, they're inconclusive. You're not really sure if the person on the other end of this digital exchange is the good customer that you want to do business with or the fraudster that you want to try to kick out. Mm -hmm. So what happens is, a lot of times that you revert back to some form of multi-factor authentication. You know, one of the most popular ones out there in use today are these things called one-time passcodes or OTPs. Mm -hmm. But when, when IT and Arca Group is talking to FIs, they're really wanting to try to minimize the use of any kind of multi-factor authentication because they weren't, they're trying to provide as streamlined of an experience and as low friction as possible experience to their users. So the question is, when, when you're using location behavior, how often are the results from it conclusive, meaning that you know pretty definitively that it's either the good user or the fraudster? And then also, how, how many times is it inconclusive and gray and that you need to go off and use some type of multi-factor authentication? Perfect. Yeah, that's, that's upwards of 95%, which is pretty good. Um, and the reason why this happens is, um, in, in our case more specifically, uh, what Incognito does is a combination of device fingerprinting and what we call location fingerprinting, right? So um, by combining these two signals, we're able to understand two things. One is, can we trust this device? And the other question we, we would ask is, is this location behavior consistent with your historical behavior, right? So the first one is pretty straightforward. If it's the device that you always use, that's fine. We, we are probably going to authorize you to, to keep using it. Um, but in case it's a new device, right? You, as, as I told before, like it, you just bought a new iPhone. What do we do? Well, if you're setting up your account on this new device from home or from a location that you go very frequently, it's very unlikely that the fraudster uh, just got a new phone and decided to break into your house, right? So, um, so that in this case, we can trust this new device right away, even though we, we still don't have a lot, a lot of information about it. 
because the location behavior is consistent. So the scenarios in which this analysis would be inconclusive are basically scenarios in which you're using a new device in a place that you've never been before. So let's say that you, for example, have traveled and you forgot your phone at home and you bought a new phone when you got to the destination. So it's a very unlikely situation. Obviously it, it could happen, um, but that's why uh, we're able to recover uh, the vast majority of the authentication events because in most cases we're talking about a device that has already accessed that account and also uh, the location behavior tends to be uh, quite consistent as we've seen on, on the previous slide. So in that particular example, uh, when you, we, you you pick up a new phone because you left your 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 one at home, um, sometimes as we're talking to our financial institution clients, they're, they're talking about identity proofing, meaning you know at the first time a user is signing up for an account. So you know the example that you showed here in terms of authentication is helpful. But how long does it take for the system to actually learn good locations versus bad locations for a user? Does it take you know multiple um, days or weeks in order to be able to figure out good locations versus bad for a brand new user? Or are you able to address the needs of a brand new user pretty quickly? Excellent. Yeah, that's that's a great question. So um, let's separate in, in two groups here. One one is um, when we're talking about new customers, right? So these these customers are still unknown and you're onboarding them. So you, you have to, to to verify their identity. What we do with location in this case is to match the physical behavior to the address associated to that identity, right? So when you scan your driver's license, for example, your physical address is right there. Um, we would match that to the device's behavior to see, okay, are you at this location right now um, as you're opening this account? The response would be yes for 85% of the, the situations. So that means that we already have one data point, but with that one data point, we're still not able to prove that you live there, right? There's a high probability, but we're not still, still not able to prove that you live in that location. Uh, so what we do then is we, we keep collecting information from that device until we're able to, to say, okay, this phone sleeps at this location every night or has uh, slept at this location for the past uh, seven days, for example, right? So it usually takes between one and two weeks to reach that conclusion. But from day one, um, we're already able to say, again, for not 80, 80, 85% of the cases that the user is at that location. So that's on the individual level. The other part is if we already have that device on our network, right? So in the beginning, uh, Caitlin shared that we have a network of 200 million devices, which means that if this device is already part of that network, from day one, we'll be able to say, yes, this user actually lives here. And then we'll be able to use that to verify address information. And the reason why this is important is, again, there's a lot of PII data out there. So fraudsters are getting access to this information and using it to create uh, accounts um, with with those data points. So adding an extra layer of verification, in this case using location behavior, is a good way to prevent um, fake accounts uh, from being opened. So that's the account opening piece. Uh, for existing accounts, um, what, what happens then is given that you already have, as a financial institution, the user's home address, because it was part of the KYC process. Mm -hmm. What's particularly interesting is that we see that about 50% of the logins at least occur from home, which means that from day one, even if we haven't learned the user's uh, location behavior patterns, we're already able to authenticate them without friction 50% of the time. And then it takes us usually one or two weeks to reach 90% probability to authenticate this user with zero friction, right? So that means that day one, you start at 50, so that's your ba baseline, 50% probability 
that you'll be able to offer a secure and frictionless experience. And in two weeks, you'll be able to offer that 90% of the time. Yeah, that's pretty interesting. Up to 90% of the time. That's pretty nice. Well, uh, financial institutions have two choices. They either can deploy a solution that is called passive authentication, where it's a tool that basically is silent. It, it's behind the scenes. You know, there's nothing that the user has to do. And then there's also active authentication tools that uh, where the user has to take some type of action uh, in order to be able to authenticate themselves. You know, typing in an OTP code is a good example of, of an active authentication uh, solution, something that the user actually has to physically perform. So when we're looking at deploying location-based fraud detection, uh, what does the user experience look like? You know, what does the user need to do to actively uh, set up or turn on or enable location? Yeah, so the end user, what, what they have to do is basically to enable location services for that application. Right? So they, they have to grant access to location data to that app. Um, and, and what's particularly interesting is that um, I, I've been working in the, the location-based services space for now more than 12 years. And um, prior to starting Cognia, uh, I, I was running another company that was in the location-based marketing space. And one of the biggest challenges we had was to um, like convince end users to share their location data for that use case. Usually we were talking about uh, opt-in rates around 20 to 40% in the best cases. So when we started in Cognit, that was for us the number one concern. Like, are users going to share location data with these apps or not, right? What was a very positive surprise was that for security use cases, users are a lot more uh, comfortable sharing location information. Um, in my opinion, that's basically because the user recognized that there is more value on sharing location information with their bank so they can secure their accounts rather than sharing information with um, an app that's going to use that data to send them uh, targeted advertising, right? So um, we're seeing today that about 90% of the users are opting in to, to sharing location with their bank, basically because they're recognizing that if they do so, their account is going to be more protected and they will also experience uh, a more frictionless uh, authentication uh, process. Well, that's a great win-win situation. You got high adoption rates because people want to feel more secure online and it's also a pretty easy thing to go off and do. So if, if a user is sharing the location data uh, and they're be able to safeguard against the fraudsters, what can what can mobile apps do to achieve higher opt-in rates for location permissions? Is there anything from a you know some of the institutions that we deal with you know have their own internal mobile apps or maybe they can have uh, add-ons to the mobile apps they're using from a third party? But what are some of the best practices from a mobile app standpoint in order to get higher opt-in rates from consumers? Perfect. Well, for me, it's all about timing and messaging. So uh, when it comes to timing. Uh, the earlier in the journey, the better. So basically, right there when the user is creating their account on the, or when they're doing the first login in case they already have an account but they're logging in from a new device, mm -hmm. you should ask for location services. But uh, the way we always recommend customers to do so is by being very clear with the customer that this data will be used to protect their accounts, right? And um, once that happens, we, we usually see um, opt-in rates above 90%. Uh, in, in, in the scenarios, we, we had some customers that didn't disclose their users that this data was going to be used for security purposes. We saw that the opt-in rates were around uh, 20 to 40%. So very different results. Uh, so I strongly recommend that you are transparent with your customer and you tell them, okay, location is being collected for your protection. Yeah, transparency is the best situation in this. You know, tell the consumer really what's going on and they'll tend to actually have a much better impersonation or impression in terms of you. Yeah, yeah. by yeah. the way, uh, one, one additional comment here, which was 
quite surprising to me actually was to see what Apple did uh, in terms of leveraging location for uh, fraud prevention and authentication purposes. So uh, Apple Pay has recently introduced uh, this new feature in which for every uh, Visa credit card, uh, they are now enforcing uh, the use of location services for fraud prevention purposes, which is going back to your first question, uh, a, a pretty interesting thing because first, Apple has definitely access to the best device ID possible, right? Because they own the hardware. So mm -hmm. it's it's deterministic. Like you're not really trying to create a fingerprint. Like they have the hardware. So they do have the best device ID. Second, Apple also has the best on-device biometric system uh, available, which is Face ID, right? Which is uh, pretty pretty accurate and and sophisticated and still, they have added uh, location as a mandatory signal for fraud prevention on Apple Pay. So, um, and the way they're doing it is is quite different than what we're doing, which is Apple is actually enforcing users to share location data. They don't have an option. It's like, if you don't want to share location uh, with, with Apple Pay, remove your Visa credit card. Otherwise you can't use the service. I think it create, caused us a little bit of a wave when they came out with that not that long ago in terms of, uh, you know, how importantly they're actually enforcing that location use within Apple Pay. You know, we yeah. got a lot of comments about that. You, I, I've run into people, and I'm just, I got three daughters, and so they're a great example of this. Uh, you know, my daughters keep their location turned on all the time. Uh, I, on the other hand, don't. I, I keep location turned off on my phone. Uh, unless I really need it in order just to be able to conserve the battery on my uh, uh, on my phone. But wouldn't users be concerned about using location behavior fraud detection if it drains the battery? Yeah, for sure, for sure. Um, well, in, in our case, our solution works in both scenarios. So either if the user enables uh, the, the collection all the time or only while using the app, um, what we really need is while the user is using the app because that's where uh, like exist the, the risk is right so um when the user is actually um using the application uh so in this case if the user decides to share only while using this is not going to affect the, the battery at all and if the user enables uh background data collection um it, it's going to consume less than half a percent in 24 hours so it's it's not uh, that meaningful the, the way we, we were able to optimize it to that point was that we, we have created uh, a technology that leverages the mobile sensors like accelerometer and gyroscope to identify when you arrive or depart a location. And that's the only moment in which we would collect data. So if you're stationary, if you're like at home, or if you're even on the move, for example, you're traveling, uh, we won't be collecting location information, um, but we will only do that once you arrive or depart a specific uh, location. So just to make sure I understood you correctly, you said that using location behavior only consumes 0.5% of the battery over the course of a day's time? Exactly, yeah. Wow, that's, that's pretty low. Yeah. Yeah. In a prior life, you know, I had fraud detection systems that I managed uh, in order to protect a suite of financial uh, banks and credit unions here in the United States. And there was no shortage of vendors uh, showing up on my door uh, with a new solution and, you know, trying to get me to deploy something different. And it, and it really came down to me being able to understand you know what would this new solution do in terms of being able to mitigate fraud losses you know how much lower can i drive my fraud uh, and also how i could also potentially improve or minimize false positives meaning declining a good card holder that i thought that you know uh, i thought was a fraudster but i mistakenly inter inter misinterpreted this good consumer to be a fraudster so Mm -hmm. Do you have any kind of examples from people that you've worked with that kind of shows, you know, what what your solution can do, what location behavior can do that will take fraud detection to another level? Perfect. Yeah, we we, we certainly do. Um, we we actually 
brought a few examples here uh, as part of this presentation. So the first one is a is a, a Brazilian neobank called Wheelbank. Um, they they were facing a lot of issues with uh, social engineering uh, scams that were leading to account takeover fraud, and uh, at, at the time they were using a combination of um, device fingerprinting, behavioral biometrics, and uh, OTPs. Right? So that's that that was their stack, um, and there's they were still um, suffering from from ATO fraud. Um, it, it was particularly interesting, and, and I'm starting to notice this more frequently, which is um, fraudsters in Brazil are quite creative, and we're usually seeing uh, new attacks being uh, like starting over there, and they usually come to the US in like a, a one to two, two year uh, time frame. frame. So um, this was about two years ago, um, and it was a pretty smart type of attack in which they were using social media bots uh, to, to social engineer the user, so it, it was quite scalable. Um, and, anyways, once they deployed our solution, they have seen the the ATO fraud going down very significantly. And what was particularly interesting was that they've seen a ninety percent reduction in fraud losses. They have a sizable user base with four million users. Um, we we have. So far, authenticated more than 200 million sessions on their mobile app. And for sessions that were uh, enabled by location, uh, we had zero ATO fraud so far, which means that when location services are enabled and we're leveraging this type of data for authentication purposes, the, the fraudsters were still not able uh, so far to figure out how to bypass the security. The reason why is basically because um, we have built our proprietary location technology that is spoofing resistance. So even if the user is using uh, fake G GPS applications or trying to spoof their IP address, we would still recognize the true location. Um, and, and that's why we're being able to, to do that. So uh, there was a 90% fraud reduction, uh, but that's associated to a 90% opt-in rate, right? So if the opt-in rate was 100%, meaning that all of their users have enabled location services, the fraud rate would be actually zero. Um, so that, that was particularly interesting. And the other thing was that the false positive rate was very low, was uh, below 0.001%. 0 0.001% 0 of a false positive is pretty darn close to zero. I, I don't see too many solutions yeah. out there that can get to that low of a rate as well as being able to deliver such a high d a percentage of uh, reduction in fraud losses too. That's that's pretty impressive. Um, so most of the people in the audience on the call here today uh, already have some kind of fraud solutions in place to authenticate their customers. So yeah. How would how would someone on the, in the on the on this webinar today? How would they actually deploy location behavior in an existing control framework or technology stack, along with the other tools that they currently have right now? Perfect. So, as this is a passive signal, uh, this is not going to interfere in the user experience at all. So that's the the good news, right? So you you won't really need to change uh, the the um, user interface and and how things actually. Uh, work in the app. Um, so that that's one of the things that make the implementation of this pretty easy. Um, and going more specifically to the use cases, um, you, you have generally two major types of um, use cases here for location, right? The, the first one is for account opening when the user is onboarding to the banking application. Um, in this case, uh, my, my recommendation is to leverage location behavior uh, to validate address information, right? So most financial institutions today are doing a combination of doc plus selfie, right? So the user takes a picture of their driver's license, uh, takes a selfie, there's usually liveness detection involved, um, but there's still vulnerabilities there, right? So one of the ways to add an additional layer of protection is to get the address information that was uh, part of the, the document scanning and checking that against the device's location behavior. 
So that's one more thing that will uh, make the life of the fraudster more difficult because they'll still uh, have to do one more job uh, to, to bypass that verification, right? So that's my first recommendation. The second is for existing accounts. And in this case, we're talking about authentication events. And we have customers that are using uh, location behavior for two types of scenarios. One is for like logins, which is the most basic um, authentication event. And the other is for high risk transactions, right? So we have customers that are basically using us for logins so, so they can enable a frictionless authentication experience for most of their users. So in this case, they'll be able to reduce the reliance on things like OTPs or biometrics by usually 80 to 90%. Uh, so there is a cost reduction, there is friction reduction, and there is also significant reduction in fraud losses because this is more secure than these uh, other authentication factors. Um, but for high-risk transactions more specifically, we're seeing a lot of activity around uh, device authorization. So this is specifically targeted to uh, reducing account takeovers because when the user is setting up a new device, that's a very challenging moment. Uh, as I've, I've mentioned in the past, you don't know the device yet. Uh, usually the device is also unknown for the device from your printing vendors. Uh, you have to use step up authentication. Most of the authentication methods have vulnerabilities. So if you have a, a, an extra layer here to say, okay, even though this is a new device, the location is uh, the user's home, for example, uh, you can trust that new device more uh, more quickly. Um, and another uh, particular situation in which we're seeing a lot of usage is for um, like large financial transactions, right? So when the user is moving a lot of money, they're withdrawing like all the, all the cash they have on that account. Uh, leveraging location behavior is quite important because usually people would do that uh, in a setting in which they feel safe, right? So they would do that from home or from their office. Uh, so so leveraging that is also quite important. So it can reduce risk for uh, large financial transactions. So you don't need to completely re recraft your tech stack. You can actually add location behavior capabilities into an existing framework and then yeah. modify things over time if you want to then. Yeah, usually our customers implement this as kind of the first layer of defense. And the reason they do that is because this is both more secure, but also more user-friendly, right? So um, this will cover, as I've mentioned, like 90% of the situations, which means that you're offering a frictionless and secure experience to 90% of your good users. Um, and you're basically stepping up and, and, and adding more friction and more cost uh, for, for the other 10%. So we're usually the first layer. And then after that, they use the actually the current authentication stack they already have in place. So that's why the implementation is so simple. Yeah, that's nice. That's very nice. So I have one last question before, before we open it up to some of the questions coming in from the audience. And again, for those uh, attendees, if you do have questions, just go ahead and throw them in the question uh, chat window there and we'll get around to them. So uh, Andre, last question for you. Uh, I, I find it really hard to pick up any kind of industry publication these days that doesn't have something in there about data privacy. Uh, you got uh, the GDPR going on over in Europe. Uh, there are several states here in the United States uh, that have instituted some type of data privacy laws and you know, more states are starting to come out with those. And so in location data and PII data available via the mobile phone, seems like they could actually fit into this kind of world and be regulated in some way. So what would someone looking to deploy location behavior need to take into consideration when it comes to data privacy? and using Perfect. location behavior. Yeah, so the first thing, which by the way, the, the good news is that uh, the, the operating systems are already enforcing this, is that to get access to precise location information, you have to ask the user, right? So uh, there's no way to collect, for example, GPS information 
or or Wi-Fi and Bluetooth data, which is what we use to to reach uh, more precision and to detect uh, location spoofing. There's no way to do that without the user's consent. So the good news is that that automatically um, puts you in, in in a good situation because uh, this is um, like basically what GDPR and other privacy regulations uh, recommend for this type of data. So the operating system basically they, they help you with with, with that. Um, the other thing, which is a bit more particular to what we do, is actually the reason why uh, the name of the company is Incognito. Uh, it, it has to do with the word incognito, right? Which is about um, like an identity that is disguised, right? And, and and basically what we do is we don't associate the location behavior to any PII or biometric information. So in the end of the day like our platform doesn't really know who's that person. The reason, the, the the way we're able to recognize the user is by getting hashed and anonymized uh, ID information from our customers. But we don't know the user's name, phone number, email address, anything like that, right? So we, we just have an anonymized ID that is associated to also anonymized location behavior because what we need to do is not really to understand where you are in the world. What we need to do is to understand where you are relative to your historical behavior. So that's why we're able to deal with anonymized location information because we're comparing like your behavior to your behavior. So we don't even know where you are in the world when, you, when, when we're doing these type of analyses. Um, for the address validation use case, for example, uh, we, we use a cryptographic function called trapdoor in which we only validate the address if there is a perfect match, but we're able to do that on top of uh, uh, information that was encrypted. So we don't even know where the user lives, even though we're receiving address information. So um, we, we have implemented a bunch of protections on top of it because location data is very sensitive, but on the other hand, it is extremely powerful uh, as as we could see on on the results we we just shared, so um, balancing those two things is is quite challenging. So that's why we recommend not trying to do that internally, because there's a lot of engineering effort uh, to to be able to to do this in a privacy friendly way. Yeah, that, that's nice being able to have that information encrypted like that, so you don't have to worry about some of those other kinds of issues, if you will. Yeah. Uh, so those are all the questions that I had for you. I think that we now want to turn to some of the questions coming in from the audience. And with that, I think we're going to get some help from Caitlin. So Caitlin, if you can come back online and help facilitate some of the Q&A that we have from the audience today. Great. Thanks, David. So it looks like we uh, have an interesting question here that's come in. So at onboarding or opening a new account, how do you confirm it's a trusted location? Perfect. So in, in this case, um, once the user is um, like scanning their document, right, and, and we're able to uh, capture the address information, uh, we would basically match that to the current behavior. And if that device is already uh, part of our network of 200 million smartphones, uh, we could also verify if that is uh, the place in which that device spends most of its time, right? So. Um, by doing these two verifications, we're able to say, okay, this user uh, is who they say they are. You can trust uh, that person. On the other hand, what's also particularly interesting, and I haven't talked about it earlier here, is the concept of suspicious location. And what this is, is basically uh, like every time we see, uh, we, we receive uh, feedback from our customer that a certain user uh, happen to be a fraudster, for example, we would match that to the, the locations that they went more frequently. Um, the reason why this is important is because fraudsters are professional, right? They do that for a living. So once they commit one fraud, they're not stopping there. They're, they're going for the next one and the next one and the next one. So if you collect this feedback information and you're able to say, okay, 
this is where this browser lives. For example, every time there is a new device or even the same device trying to do something from that location, you should block it. And why is this important? Because you're basically making the attack more expensive. You're forcing the fraudster to move all the time if they want to keep doing what they do, right? So probably what's going to happen is the fraudster is going to start attacking another financial institution that is not leveraging location data in this way, right? So that's the one thing. The other part related to suspicious location is that even though this is a powerful concept and you can fight fraud using this, if you are relying on IP-based or GPS-based geolocation, this could lead to an extremely high false positive rate. Why is that? Because let's take, for example, a, 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 a dense city like New York City, for example. If the fraudster happens to live in the same building as you, that means that if you're relying on GPS information to determine suspicious locations and block every user that is on that location, you will be blocked just because you happen to live in the same building that a fraudster lives. And that's unfair, right? That's, that's not what we want. So you need to use a, a geolocation uh, technology that really is able to pinpoint the location with super high accuracy down to the apartment level. So in our case, for example, we're able to pinpoint the smartphone's position within 10 feet and even differentiating floors on a multi-story building. So basically by doing that, we're blocking the fraudster's apartment, but even though you are uh, his neighbor, you'll still be able to keep using uh, the, the, the service normally because your house was not blocked and, and, and the building was not blocked, only the, the fraudster's apartment. Well, how about um, switching gears a little bit how about if somebody's not on mobile? Can you pull location off of a push notification if the user is transacting on a web session instead of mobile? Yeah, yeah. What what we're doing uh, today, like our technology was built for mobile apps because on, on the mobile device, you have access to more sensors. Um, so um, what we do is we basically leverage the mobile app as an authenticator uh, for, for web transactions, for example. So um, there is usually a significantly high overlap between users that are using the web channel, but they also have the mobile app on their phone. So what we do in this case is we would ask the user uh, to, to confirm on the mobile app that they are the person doing uh, that transaction on the web channel. And we do that in two ways. One is as, as you've mentioned, like using a push notification. The other way is, is by asking the user to scan a QR code on the website. So what's particularly interesting about this is that that's also a, a, a good reason to drive more uh, downloads of the mobile app. Um, so, so it can offer a better and more secure user experience. So uh, that's, that's what we do. We, we would use the mobile app and we would pair it to the web channel uh, and enable that transaction to run more securely. Okay, and then switching topics, let's talk a little bit about Zelle. Do you have any use cases around Zelle fraud transactions? They're generally not very high money transfers and the customers might make transfers on the go like when they're traveling. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's a great question. So that's why uh, combining location uh, and, and device intelligence is important, right? So let's say that the user is on the go, the user is traveling. Um, they are going to be visiting new locations, right? So in this case, we're, we're talking about locations that are still not considered by us as a trusted location. But if the device is the same and the travel is feasible, meaning that, for example, to go from let's say the West Coast to the East Coast, it will usually take you about five hours or, or more. Um, if we see your device on the West Coast right now and, 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 and that device is being seen on the East Coast in one hour, 
that's impossible, right? Um, so even though you are at a new place, as long as the travel was feasible and the device is the same, we would still be able to uh, provide a frictionless authentication experience uh, to, to the user. Um, and specifically talking about Zelle, um, basically like for, for financial transactions in general, what, what we're seeing is that usually 90% will still happen from a trusted location. So you could use that to, to uh, provide a frictionless experience. Uh, but in case the user is not at a, a trusted location, uh, you can still uh, approve a transaction given that the user is using the same device, for example, and the travel is feasible. Um, but one of the things we're doing, which is quite important, and, and we're seeing uh, this in, in some scenarios, is that um, we have been seeing also new physical attacks going on, which is the, the criminal will steal your device and then will um, like use that to, to transfer money using uh, instant payment solutions like Zelle, right? Why is this happening? Basically because um, for, for the criminal, that's worth a lot of money, right? Before when people would like steal uh, or, or rob uh, a mobile phone, they would sell it uh, for let's say like $200, $300. It, it, it was not enabling them to make a lot of money. But now with, with instant payment solutions like Zelle or even other apps like Cash App and PayPal, um, if, if the criminal gets your phone, they're not going to sell your phone. You're actually going to use that to get into your bank accounts, transfer money. And the issue specifically here is that the mobile phone is usually a single point of failure, right? Um, because if they're resetting your password, that's usually like the, the reset link will be sent to your email and your email is right there on that device, right? You, you don't need to put a password to en enter the email. If you're resetting uh, your password uh, using SMS, the SMS is also going to the same device. And even to reset your biomet biometric credentials, uh, that also uses SMS, right? So um, a, a recommendation I have is that your um, iCloud um, password reset should actually use another phone number. Otherwise, if someone, someone gets your phone, uh, they will be able to put their own face uh, as your face ID and then get access to your bank accounts by stealing your, your mobile device. So the way we're dealing with this is leveraging location to determine transaction limits dynamically. So if you are at a trusted location, you can send as much money as you want, but if you are outside, you can still send money, but less than uh, what you can do from home, for example. Great. That was a, a great question and answer session. I really appreciate all the questions that came in. I um, thank you for your answers, Andre. Uh, David, yep. I will uh, hand it back over to you for final thoughts and thank yous. Thank you, Caitlin. And Andre, again, thank you very much for your time today. Very interesting to learn how location behavior kind of fits into the overall framework of being able to bring, bring down fraud losses, do so in a way that's not intrusive to the consumer, uh, and then also be able to minimize false positives. I mean, it's uh, it's kind of the, the, the trifecta, if you will, from a fraud standpoint, but I uh, really appreciate helping to understand better about what this thing is called location behavior. And to the audience, thank you all very much for today as well. And if we did not get to all the questions, we will follow up with you later. Uh, thank you very much and have a great rest of the day.